Hello guys and welcome to another video. My name is Mark. I'm an entrepreneur and property investor. In a lot of my videos we talk about how we're going to succeed but in today's video I want to talk about how we're going to make sure we don't fail. I think I'm very fortunate in that I've had a lot of exposure to people who've both been successful and people who have unfortunately gone bankrupt for various reasons when it comes to property investing. So today I'm going to share those lessons with you. So let's head into the whiteboard, let's write it all down and let's get into it. If you haven't already subscribed please consider subscribing. Remember we're going to give away an investment house on this channel as well as giving our subscriber dividends away at the end of each month. So no reason not to subscribe and give it a like because it helps out with the algorithm. But Nick, let's go into the whiteboard. So guys, I know it's a bit of a horrible subject talking about people who've gone bankrupt, but I've had some candid conversations with people who have made mistakes in property investing and all of them would want me to share this information with you. So I want to make sure that it's out there, but I think it's really important that some lessons that we can all avoid and make sure that we don't make the same mistakes. So I'm going to take them one by one and I've sort of categorized them and although they've happened in different times for example in 2007 I know two or three people who went bankrupt investing in property I also know somebody who's very successful now who almost went bankrupt in 2007 so it was a very very close thing for that individual and he's very candidly told me there was a lot of very sleepless nights and it could have gone either way I think there's lots of lessons to be learned that were relevant then that are still relevant now and new lessons to be learned that are definitely relevant now but let's start off with number one and the first first point I've got on here is over leverage and there is no doubt it is harder today to over leverage than it was in 2007 for example. Back then you could get 100% mortgage, 105% mortgages, self certify your income, you know there was lots and lots of ways to over leverage back then. Today much much harder, there's lots more regulation, it's much more difficult for you to get yourself in an over leveraged position. That said it is still very possible to do a deal based on 100% of debt. For example, if you raise investor funds and then you get a mortgage, you could over leverage by getting 100% debt on a property. I, I personally know a few people who have got into a position whereby they've borrowed money, I don't know, at 10% per year, they've done some work, they're expecting X as an end value and that hasn't come through to fruition and then they're sat on an asset that's worth less than they borrowed and then wondering what to do next. And I think that's a very dangerous position to be in because quite often the people that are getting themselves in that position are people who are just starting out. So leverage, in case you don't know, is where you borrow money. That's what we call leverage. It's the loan that you're taking on the property. The most common, of course, being a mortgage. But you can also get bridge finance when you go to auction, investor finance, there's lots of other finance available that might not be scrutinized in the same sort of way. So I think it's very important to make sure that when you're looking at your own portfolio that you're not too over leveraged. Myself I'm running currently about 30 to 40 percent. I'm pretty comfortable in that bracket. I wouldn't want to go much lower. I wouldn't want to go completely to 20 or 25 percent. At the same time I wouldn't want to go much higher than 50 percent because once you start taking away the leverage property doesn't really have the same appeal for me. I'd rather do index funds if I had no leverage at all for example. But over leverage is definitely dangerous so be careful over leverage. Number two, wrong product in the wrong location. Again I've seen that go completely wrong on several occasions. People doing high spec HMOs for example in a really run down location or a high spec HMO in an area where the town just doesn't have that demand. So this is something where people go in without doing their market research. Again it tends to be somebody who's fairly new to the industry so I guess if, you, if you've been in the industry a while you understand what products work in what areas but the wrong product in the wrong location that is key. Make sure you avoid that. Do your market research, understand that there is going to be a market when it comes to sell at the end or to rent out whatever your exit might be and make sure that you've got the right product in the right location. A good example would be marble worktops, 100 grand kitchens, designer bathrooms. You shouldn't really be doing it in an 80 grand house in Mansfield. In Mayfair in central London, 5 million pound penthouse, bang on. You've got to make sure it's the right product for the right market. So number three on my list guys is development costs but I really should say property development as a whole because I've spoken to a few people who have had serious issues, again people who've gone bankrupt over development and it tends to be one of two things and I put two things on here, development end value and development costs and it tends to be one of those two things or both that go awry. So costs can quickly spiral up. 
For example, development finance is traditionally about 10% per annum. So if, for example, you had any hold up to a development and you had it on development finance, and let's say, for example, it's a big deal. Let's say, for example, it's, it's 10 million that you've got in development finance. Well, that's close to a million pounds a year. Well, it is a million pounds a year of all the hold up. So let's say, for example, planning takes longer than expected or, or the builders go bust and you have to go out to tender again. There's, there's lots of things that could happen. And during that process, not only could the financing cost start to eat into your margin, but also you could look at potentially the, the cost of doing the building work going up. Because ultimately, if you look at the cost of doing building work, for example, in 2010 versus now, it's close to double at this point. I think we were looking at about 1,200 per square meter back in 2010. And today it's close to 2,000 pounds per square meter for an average build. So it's gone up significantly. So development costs, that really can affect your balance sheet when it comes to these sort of things. And development end values, again, if you were developing in London, for example, in 2015, I know somebody who was, unfortunately, and the property prices came down. Well, he was supposed to have 10, 20% margin, I think he was saying. Well, the development costs went up, the end value went down, there was no margin, he had a margin call on his loans, wasn't able to make that margin call, lost the whole lot, lost everything he had. And ultimately it was a position that would be very hard to foresee. For example, coronavirus, who saw that coming? I never guessed my revenue would take like a 90% hit in one month. And the same applies with these sort of things. You don't really work out that your development costs are gonna go up significantly. I think it was Mark Twain that said, the things that really get us in trouble aren't the things that we don't know, it's the things that we know for sure, but just end so. And that's the case with this, right? When you're doing your costs, you're pretty sure it's 2,000 pounds per square meter. You get some delays, now it's 2,200 pounds per square meter. Your end development value was going to be X, it's now X minus 10%, and suddenly you've got a real big problem on your hands. Quite often if you're doing these sort of things, financing with external sources, the problem can be bigger than one that you can solve. And then the last thing I've got on here is running out of cash. And that again harks back to the problem being bigger than you can solve. If you're working in the many millions and you've only got a net worth of a couple of million, then you quite often can run out of cash. And if the problem becomes too big for you to solve, the developments and everything's likely to be taken away from you while the creditors just try and get a return on their investments. So I think it's really important that you go into any of these projects with a, a good war chest of cash understanding where your risk might be and understanding how you would mitigate most of those risks. I think there's an awful lot of lessons when it comes to looking at people who have spoken to me and given me all this information. It's very, very valuable to look back at failure as well as success. And we do a lot of looking at success and understanding the process to get to the end destination, don't we? But quite often we just need to look at how people may have tripped up when they're running towards their destination. And these things are the things that come up over and over again for me. Now, I'm not doing this in any way, shape or form to pour water on anybody's fire. Please don't take it that way at all. I just want to make you guys aware of the risks when it comes to being a property investor. And I'm going to run through them one more time just to make sure we're really clear. Number one, over leverage. If you're borrowing 100% of the value of a property and you don't manage to make that end value stack up, you're in trouble. Number two, wrong product in the wrong location. If you're building a high quality all marble kitchen in the middle of Doncaster in a 50 grand house, again, probably the wrong location for that product. Not that there's anything wrong with Doncaster, just put the right product there. Property development, development costs and development end value. You've gotta be so careful when stacking up these deals that might be bigger than a problem that you would be big enough to solve. And that harks back to the last one, which is running out of cash and not being able to solve those short-term cash crunches when you need to. So guys, I hope this video has been useful. I hope you get some value from it. As I said, I'm not trying to pour water on anybody's fire. I just wanna make you aware of the risks that are involved as well as the rewards, because we talk so much about the rewards, and believe me, there's loads of them. But these are the risks, stay clear of them, do your sums, make sure it all stacks up, and I wish you every success when it comes to property investing.